Children of the living God, come and sing, sing out loud. Children of the living God, sing to the living God. Chapter 24, verses 1 through 12. This morning, Understanding the Resurrection, that's the title of the message this morning. So last week, as you remember, if you came here last week or you listened to the live stream, we looked at the three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. Remember that? That was after the cross, which we believe, I sincerely believe that was on Thursday at twilight when he went into the tomb. And then from that time to the resurrection, Resurrection Sunday, which we're going to study this morning, were three days and three nights. Thus, Matthew chapter 12, verse 40. These are Jesus' words, his prophecy. For as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the great fish, so will the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. And then two Sundays ago, we covered the cross, right? The three days and three nights last week, two Sundays ago, we covered the cross. And that's the count where we see that death and sin were defeated. Okay, so Luke chapter 23, verse 46 says that, and when Jesus had cried out with a loud voice, he said, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. Having said this, he breathed his last. And so that was the defeat of sin, because sin has no power over something that's dead. That's why we need to, what, reckon the old man dead. Sin has no more power. So this morning, we begin to look at the resurrection. And that's in chapter 24. And that is the fact of the matter, the resurrection. It's a fact, I believe, and hopefully you do as well, because Jesus is raised. And that is the great masterpiece of the Christian faith. Think about it. That's the masterpiece of Christianity. Jesus is raised. He's risen. He's risen indeed. And we're going to be looking at that over the next two weeks, this Sunday and next Sunday. And so think about this logic. Disprove the resurrection. And what happens? Christianity goes away. If you disprove the resurrection, no more Christianity. And you know what? Many have tried to do that, but they haven't been able to. How many know who C.S. Lewis is? Chronicles of Narnia. Remember that whole set of, uh, I guess it was children's uh, uh, books actually for, it started out. But then they did some movies on that. C.S. Lewis, the Chronicle of Nar Narnia. He's an apologetics guy, and he's um, with the Lord. But he actually tried to do that. He was a pagan trying to disprove the cross and the resurrection, and then he became a believer. How about Josh McDowell? How many have heard him? He wrote that book, Evidence That Demands a Verdict. He too tried and he failed. They tried to disprove the resurrection as pagans, but in the end, they became believers. And then they began to write to defend the faith, particularly the resurrection. And so it's interesting how that happens when you think about it. And I believe that's how it always happens. When we truly and honestly take a look at the scriptures and study them, you know what's going to happen? You're going to believe in the resurrection. If you honestly and truly study the scriptures. And you know, it's always amazing to me, and these are educated people. You talk to somebody that questions the Bible. People go to universities. You see it all the time. They say, well, what about this? What about this? And I say, well, what about it? Let's read the Bible. Have you read the Bible? And they haven't read the Bible. Oh, I've heard. I've heard from my teacher, my professor, my friend, but they never read it. And so how can you have a discussion? I mean, think about this, right? If you go to a doctor and your doctor says, hey, I'd like to have a surgery. I, I haven't actually gone to school, but I haven't studied these things, but I've heard about it. What are you going to do? You're going to find another doctor, aren't you? Now, why would you do that with somebody that is talking about Christ? They don't know Christ. They never committed their life to Christ. They never opened the Bible. They may have heard some little blips on the Bible. And you're going to believe them? It doesn't make any sense, right? And so I really believe it's on my heart. If you truly read the Bible and ask Jesus, give him a chance to be your Lord and Savior, you will believe on the resurrection. It makes perfect sense. There's a lot of evidence. There's ample evidence. We're going to look at that over the next couple of weeks. And so we're also going to look at the next two Sundays, what the resurrection accomplished. If somebody were to ask you that a question, what did the resurrection accomplish? Would you be able to answer them? 
What did it mean for the disciples in that first generation? There were eyewitness accounts. How many eyewitness accounts were there? Anybody know? We don't know the exact count. What do you think? 5, 10, 50, 20, 25, 30, 45, 50, hundreds? Over 500? There's over 500. Can you imagine? Now, I'd have questions, too. If one guy, you know, or an isolated few people say, oh, I saw the risen Lord. Say, oh, maybe he had, you know, a bad day or, I don't know, he had some bad food or whatever. But can you imagine appearing to 500 people at one time? I mean, even if the risen Lord appeared to us, which is about what? 25, 30 people at one time? It's a pretty radical eyewitness account, wouldn't you say? Can you imagine appearing to over 500 people at one time? See, there's all kinds of evidence if you study the scriptures. And so we're going to look at this, some of these questions. What did the resurrection accomplish? What did it mean for those first disciples, eyewitness accounts? What does it mean for us who rely on these eyewitness accounts? And do we truly understand the resurrection and its implications? We're going to look at that more this, this morning. So we're going to look at these questions and find answers in the scriptures, particularly in some of Paul's doctrinal letters, which we're going to get to more next week. But I'm going to just share this one with you. 1 Corinthians chapter 15 is a classic chapter on the resurrection, one of them, and what it means for believers. And in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 19, Paul wrote this, If in this life... Only we have hope in Christ. We are, of all men, the most pitiable. Now think about it. It makes a lot of sense. If in this life only we have hope in Christ, then we are to be pitied as Christians. If you find your hope in this life as a Christian, then you're missing the entire point. Our hope is not in this life. Our hope is in what? Eternal life. And that's why Paul wrote this. It's really prefaced on the resurrection. 1 Corinthians 15 is a real classic chapter on Jesus being raised. It's where all the rapture verses are. And he writes this. He begins his apologetic on the resurrection with this. If in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men the most pitiable. And in this thought, Paul begins to lay out a logical argument for our hope. Why do we as Christians have hope? I gotta tell you, it's not because of this life. Do you have hope in this life? I would say you're very foolish. I don't know how many funerals I've done. Matter of fact, I did a, a wedding. I love to do weddings. I did a wedding yesterday, but you know, I, I'm not kidding you. And I just shared this with my wife, Marcy. I said, you know, it's interesting. I have a log of all the weddings and the funerals I do. I do four, for every one wedding I do, I do four funerals. I don't know about you, maybe that's going to keep you from coming to this church, but it's just the season of life that I'm in. And I remember this, when I was in college, coming out of college, boy, I would go to maybe sometimes, certain years, eight, eight weddings in a year. But now, I'm in my 60s, I do about maybe eight, nine funerals in a year. It's the reality of life. This life is passing away, people. I don't know how young or old you are, but there'll be a day when we read the last here. And so our hope cannot be here. Our hope here is temporal. Our hope needs to be eternal. And this is what Paul is saying. If as Christians we find our hope here, then we've missed the point. Then we're fools. And we're to be pitied amongst all men. Our hope is in eternity so ponder that for for bed however the good news is that Jesus Christ is raised and because of that we do have a hope and that hope is eternal his body was raised it was resurrected and he now is at the right hand of the father in heaven as the scriptures say and so there's much to understand and much to rejoice in the resurrection of our Lord and we're going to do just that in these final two weeks of our study of the Gospel of Luke. So we're going to begin with Luke chapter 24, verses 1 through 12. All right? I'm going to have all of you stand, and we're going to read the Word of God together. And we'll look at the parts in a bit. Luke chapter 24, verse 1 says, Now on the first day of the week, very early in the morning, they and certain other women with them came to the tomb, bringing the spices which they had prepared. 
Verse 2, but they found the stone rolled away from the tomb. Then they went in and did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. Verse 4, and it happened as they were greatly perplexed about this, that behold, two men stood by them in shining garments. Then as they were afraid and bowed down, bowed their, head, their faces excuse me, to the earth, they said to them, why do you seek the living among the dead? He is not here, but is risen. Remember how he spoke to you when he was still in Galilee, saying, The Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified and the third day rise again. Verse 8, And they remembered his words. Verse 9, Then they returned from the tomb and told all these things to the eleven and to all the rest. Verse 10, It was Mary Magdalene, Joanna, Mary, the mother of James, and the other women with them who told these things to the apostles. And their words seemed to them like idle tales, and they did not believe them. Verse 12, but Peter arose and ran to the tomb, and stooping down, he saw the linen clothes lying by themselves, and he departed, marveling to himself at what had happened. Our Lord, I just want to lift up these scriptures to you and ask that you... Give us revelation, Lord, that you would give us understanding, not just in our minds, but in our hearts, that we would be changed by the teaching of the word. Lord, I pray once again that we leave this place different than how we came, that your spirit would touch each one here, those tuned into the live stream as well, that by your spirit you would change us, mold and shape us into your image, I pray. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, you can be seated. All right, so we're going to jump right in the parts. Verse 1 says, Now on the first day of the week, very early in the morning, they and certain other women with them came to the tomb, bringing the spices which they had prepared. Verse 2, But they found the stone rolled away from the tomb. Now, what we probably should do at this point is read the other three Gospels and their accounts of this same event and then piece together the entire scenario. Because when you read the three Gospels, there are different perspectives on what had happened. Different eyewitness accounts, different perspectives. And so it would be similar, and I gave this example last, so I'm going to give it again. Let's say there was an accident right here on Bonnie Brain Temple. And so we were to be interviewed on what happened in the accident. Well, it would be to the left of me. It would be to the right of you. Now, is that different? Is that a contradiction? No. It's a different eyewitness account, for sure, but from a different perspective. Somebody crossed the street, right? It'd be them looking north. From us here, it would be us looking south. No contradiction. The truth is the truth, but from different perspectives. And so it is with the gospel accounts. Different accounts, for sure, as you read all four gospels, but the same truth from different perspectives. So I want you to note that. And so it would be well worth you in your own time to read the other gospel accounts. Now let me give you these accounts. This is your homework. I'm giving you homework every week now, huh? Okay. So Matthew chapter 28, verses 1 through 10. You want to read that? Matthew chapter 1, chapter 28, verses 1 through 10. Also, the gospel of Mark, chapter 16, verses 1 through 8. Let me say that again, taking notes. The Gospel of Mark, chapter 16, verses 1 through 8. And then finally, John, chapter 20, verses 1 through 10. You want to particularly read that one. John, chapter 20, verses 1 through 10, along with what we just read. The Gospel of Luke, chapter 24, verses 1 through 12. And so as you read these different accounts, you're going to observe, as you put on your observation spectacles, that they're different accounts for sure. They're all talking about the same thing. Now, I've done this in my own time, several times, actually. And this is what I've come up with in piecing together all these four different accounts. The events of early morning Resurrection Sunday went something like this. Okay? Now, don't take my word for it. You read it yourself. But I'm going to piece these things together. So we just have 12 verses in the Gospel of Luke. It doesn't record all the details. You have to take all of them, right, and piece them together. And so this is what I've come up with. Check it out for yourself. Okay, so Mary Magdalene started off with the other ladies for the tomb. But in her eagerness to get there, she went on ahead of the other ladies. And when she came to the tomb, probably several minutes before the others, and I would say maybe up to 30 minutes before the others, she was astonished and saw that the stone was rolled away. 
Now, she just saw the stone rolled away. She didn't go in at that point. And so her immediate thought was probably that they had moved the body because the stone was rolled away. They had moved the body of Jesus. So without waiting for the other ladies, she hightailed it back to tell Peter and John that the stone was rolled away from the entrance of the sepulcher. And you can read about that in the Gospel of John, John chapter 20. Now the other ladies then arrived several minutes later, maybe about 30 minutes. But they then saw the angels who told them that Jesus had risen and told them to go and tell the other disciples. Now we just read that account briefly in Luke chapter 24. And so these ladies come, but it's after Mary Magdalene. Mary Magdalene is already gone by the time that she, these other ladies came. Now, in the meanwhile, Mary Magdalene gets to where Peter and John are staying. And she tells them that the stone was rolled away. She hasn't looked inside yet. Hasn't seen the angels, but the stone was rolled away. So they come and investigate. They run to the tomb, but John runs a little faster and gets there before Peter. Again, John chapter 20 records this. As Mary Magdalene comes to tell Peter and John, they hightail it back to the tomb. John gets there before Peter. Now, Mary Magdalene also comes back to the tomb, but far behind John and Peter. And by that time, the time that she gets back to the tomb, Peter and John have already seen the empty tomb and have left. And the ladies were prior to that. They have left. But then Mary Magdalene comes back not knowing that the other ladies had seen the angels, which we just read in Luke chapter 24. This time, though, Mary Magdalene looks inside the tomb, and she sees the two angels. And then she meets Jesus himself in his resurrected body. And so we know from John's gospel that the first person that Jesus appeared to in his resurrected body was who? Mary Magdalene. Isn't that interesting? Now, in that culture, I'm thinking about, you know, if I'm going to make something up, I wouldn't make it up where our Lord appears to a woman. Because they didn't trust the women in those days. Sorry, ladies, that's how it was. They didn't. Let alone a harlot. Mary Magdalene was a harlot. And Jesus chose to appear to her firstly. But that is the scenario, that's the chronology that would account for the descriptions of all four Gospels. But again, it'd be good for you to read it yourself. Don't take my, my word for it, but you read it yourself. But I say this because there are no contradictions in Scripture. Just have to do some study. Now, there's differences for sure. But you've heard people say, hey, it says this, and then it says this was from different perspectives. It's from different viewpoints. It doesn't make the truth different. Truth is truth, but it's from different eyewitness accounts. And therefore, with these different perspectives, as you take them together, they seamlessly can be accounted for, which to me makes the Bible even more believable. You know what makes the Bible less believable? And some of you have kids, maybe you know this. And I'm the youngest of five. And my parents were pretty smart. When all five of us kids would come with the same story, why we kind of crossed the street when we shouldn't have, ah, oh, they knew something was up. You know, if we were to make up something, it's all going to sound the same, isn't it? But if you're going to tell the truth, it's going to be a little different from different perspectives. And so this, to me, the different eyewitness accounts, but it all can be pieced together, it proves that what we have here in the Bible is the truth. And so we have here in our Luke passage only a portion of the account of the empty tomb. I want you to note that. You want to read these other scriptures to get the fuller account. But there's no contradiction. It only supports that what they saw was true. Now, verse 1. <clears throat> On the first day of the week, it says, very early in the morning, they and, other, and certain other women with them came to the tomb, bringing the spices which they had prepared. But they found the stone rolled away from the tomb. Now, this first day of the week, which day would that be? 
Monday? Sunday. Sunday. All right. Okay, you guys are on it. Don't say Monday. That's the first day of my week and your week. But it was Sunday, okay? That's the first day of the week of the Jewish calendar. The Jewish week begins on Sunday. And when's the last day of the Jewish week? It would be Saturday, which is their Sabbath day, right? Therefore, I draw this to your attention because the three days and three nights in the heart of the earth was completed when? On Sunday. And it began when? The three days and three nights. The day before the Sabbath, Thursday. And that's why we underscore, we, we really emphasize this, that Jesus, he died at twilight, thus fulfilling the Passover. He was the final Passover lamb. Twilight when? Thursday. And so the scripture as Jonah was three days and three nights in the heart of the belly of the huge fish, so the Son of Man would be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. We have three days and three nights, Thursday night, Friday night, Saturday night. Three days, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. I don't think our Lord would have made a mistake on that. And so we see here this first day of the week is Sunday. That fulfills that prophecy. Now here in Luke's account, notice he highlights they and certain other women with them. Notice that. These refer to the women who prepared spices and fragrant oils to treat the body before it was placed in the tomb. You can look back with me at Luke chapter 23, verse 56, which we covered last week. These women are the first ones to the tomb on Sunday morning after the weekly Sabbath. They're also listed in verse 9. But these are the ones, remember, they're watching Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus take down the body before the, not the weekly Sabbath, but before the Passover Sabbath. There were two Sabbaths that week. I took down the body. That was Thursday night. That began the Passover Sabbath. Then you have the weekly Sabbath, Friday, which is Friday, Sunday, excuse me, to Saturday, Sunday, which is Saturday. And then you have Sunday, the Resurrection Sunday. Okay, so very important to piece all these things together. The scripture is very clear, very concise, very detailed, if we would study it. Three days and three nights, Jesus was in the heart of the earth. It's great. So these women that saw the body being taken down Thursday at sundown, put in the tomb. These are the first ones at the tomb Sunday morning. And so... These are all listed in uh, verse 9 as well. Now, verse 3 says, Then they went in and did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. Now, this here would be the women minus who? Mary Magdalene. As I mentioned, Mary Magdalene got there first. She didn't go in. She saw the, the stone rolled and she went back and she ran to get Peter and John. So these women that got there at that time, right here in verse 3, this would be minus Mary Magdalene, who got there several minutes before. Now, verse 4 says, And it happened as they were greatly perplexed about this, that behold, two men stood by them in shining garments. Now, this would be two who? Would these be men, really? These would be the two angels. These would be the two angels that Mary Magdalene saw when she returned to the tomb after these ladies. But here we have the record of these ladies. They saw these two angels. Now, I want you to note this. Mary Magdalene has, has her own personal encounter with these two angels. And that's recorded in John chapter 20, verse 12. Okay? If you're taking notes. Now, verse 5. Then as they were afraid and bowed their faces to the earth, they said to them, Why do you seek the living among the dead? Verse 6, he is not here. He is risen. Remember how he spoke to you when he was still in Galilee, saying, verse 7, the Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified and the third day rise again. Verse 8, and they remembered his words. Now, firstly, these are the monumental words of the Christian faith, really. Notice in verse 6, he is not here. He is risen. Our Lord is risen. And he's risen indeed. See, this is the masterpiece of the Christian faith right here. Doesn't get any higher than that. Our Lord is risen. Our Lord Jesus Christ is no longer in the tomb. He's risen. 
And you know what? Our hope, it flows from that. That's where hope is. No resurrection, people, no hope. If he's still in that tomb, you have no hope. You're dead in your sins. Paul said it best. I said it before. I quoted it. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 19. If in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are to be the most pitiable of all men. You see, as a Christian, if you call yourself a Christian, if you find your hope in this life, what Paul is saying, you're a fool. Now, how many find your hope in this life? Let's be honest. There are so many years, even as I was a young Christian, I found my hope in my job, in my relationships, even my family. Now, these aren't bad things, but ultimately, if my hope is not in Christ, Paul is saying you're a fool. Because all these other things in this life, here today, gone tomorrow, the only thing that's eternal, the only thing that we have a secure hope in that's never going to leave us, is Jesus Christ resurrected. But, you know, that's the interesting thing that many a Christian live otherwise, don't they? I was, for one like that, many years. I said I was a Christian, but, you know, my job was more important. Making money was more important. Certain relationships were more important. Now, I'm not saying that those are bad things. But you know what the most important thing in your life has to be for your hope, for you to have hope? is Jesus Christ, risen from the dead. That's where your hope needs to be. That's where your hope is eternal. That's where it will never, never vanish. And Paul said it best. If in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men the most pitiable. Let's continue on. Now, notice in verse 8 as well. It is interesting to me here that only now they remembered his words. That to me is fascinating. Only now they remembered his words. Remember how Jesus was telling them repeatedly over and over again? He would be delivered to the Gentiles and be mocked and insulted and spit upon. And they would scourge him and kill him. And on the third day he will rise. Luke chapter 18 verses 32 and 33. I just read that. But that wasn't the first time. There's three times recorded in Luke's gospel and probably more times. Remember as he was traveling down from Mount Hermon there that last six months before he goes to Jerusalem? Why are we going to Jerusalem, Jesus? They don't like you there. He so I'm going to die. He kept on telling them over and over again. But it went over their heads. They couldn't understand. All these times, I believe, he's telling them this and... Only now they remembered his words? Only now? Why now? Why only now? I don't know, it's kind of a question that comes to my mind. Well, you know, I don't really have an answer to why. Why now? But I think we can all observe that that, that oftentimes is the case. We can relate to this. You see, there are certain times that we remember things that the Lord has spoken to us that we have forgotten. Anybody had that happen? The Lord brings something. Oh, you know, the Lord told me that, but boy, I forgot. It happens to me often, if I can be honest. The Lord told me about that. The Lord warned me about that, but you know, I forgot. And then there's also certain things that we don't understand until something, sometime later. I don't know if that happens. It happens to me a lot too. I don't understand, but I come to understand. See, the thing goes over our heads now, but then in God's perfect time we remember, and in God's perfect time we understand, and that's the life of faith. You're not going to understand everything. You know why? Because you're not God. That's why. And that's a good thing. We live by faith. You know, we don't even live by understanding. The Bible doesn't tell us that. We live by faith. Because by faith you're not going to understand everything, because you're not God. And you're not going to remember everything until God allows you to remember things. And so I've had that happen to me many times. I think there will be many times more in the future. And you know what I think it has to do with? It has to do with maturity. Sometimes we're just not mature enough to understand things. And so our Lord keeps it from our memory until we can. I think the Lord does do that. I look back in my life. 
The reason I didn't understand because I wasn't mature, to, mature enough to understand it. And so he waits. You see, it's the Lord's sovereign plan to work because there are things that I'm not supposed to know and understand until I'm ready. And when I'm ready, that right time will come. Such is the life of faith. You know, it taps into that principle that we've seen over and over again in Scripture that it's always the Lord's will, it's always the Lord's way, and it's always in the Lord's time. The Lord's will, way, and time is what will prevail. And I think that our remembering and understanding is a direct function of God's timing. When is the time? We will remember. When the time is right, we're going to remember and we'll, we're going to understand. And once we do remember and understand, we need to act upon that. And here we see eventually the disciples will react rightly to the resurrection. They will come to understand the resurrection, but right now they're a bit confused, aren't they? And they did not remember what the Lord had foretold them about the resurrection until now. It's interesting, until after it happened. If anything, the Lord could have said, now don't ever say this, but the Lord could have said, probably we would say, I told you so. Don't ever say that. But the Lord could have said that, but he didn't. You see, it will take further time for them, but in the end, they will respond to the resurrection. And they will respond rightly with understanding. It's going to take time. And that is really what this final chapter in Luke is all about. It's about the disciples coming to an understanding of the resurrection. There will need to be a right reaction from them. And that will take a bit of time, a bit of maturity. But it's going to come. And I think there's much application for us to glean in this. Because there are things that we just aren't going to understand until later. And if you're anything like me, I'm preaching to the choir, it basically means I won't understand until I get a little older, until I'm a little bit more mature in my faith. But there's something in age that brings wisdom and understanding. It really is something with age. Your things in my later years that I understand and remember because I'm a little bit more mature than I was as a young man. Now, this doesn't necessarily guarantee wisdom age. I mean, there's a lot of unwise people that are old. But for the wise, or at least for the potentially wise, an important component is time, and specifically age. But what we can be doing in our age, as time goes by, is simply staying the course. Staying the course of being faithful in what we do know and what we do understand. And in due time, our Lord will give us wisdom for those other things that we need to mature into to understand. But being faithful in the things we understand now keeps us on course for understanding the things he's going to reveal to us later. Hopefully that makes sense. I don't know everything now, and I shouldn't. But what I do know now, I'm going to be faithful with. What God has revealed to me now, and you now, let's be faithful with. And trust him to give us revelation and wisdom later. And such is the case we see here. In the death, the burial, and the resurrection of our Lord. It was, went totally over their heads. But you can see as they stay the course slowly, as they mature through time, they'll come to understand. They'll come to know. But they have to be faithful with what is in the here and now. Proverbs 16, verse 31 says this. The silver-haired head. Anybody with silver hair head? The silver-haired head, haired head is a crown of glory if it is found in the way of righteousness. Isn't that a good word? As you get older, it's going to be glorious if you're being faithful to what God has called you to do. 
Let me read that again. The silver-haired head is a crown of glory if it is found in the way of righteousness. Proverbs 16, verse 31. Now, verse 9. Then they returned from the tomb and told all these things to the eleven and to all the rest. It was Mary Magdalene, verse 10, Joanna, Mary the mother of James, and the other women with them who told these things to the apostles. Now, this sets the tone for after the empty tomb. The appointed witnesses have seen the empty tomb, but only Mary Magdalene thus far has seen the Lord. And you gather this from the other gospel accounts, specifically the gospel of John. So from this point on, Luke records several eyewitness accounts of the seeing, hearing, and handling, the touching of the risen Lord. And so the reality of the resurrection is going to be physically verified. As Josh McDowell, the Christian apologist, said, it will be the overwhelming evidence that demands a verdict. You see, what the resurrection does for the believer is it gives him hope. Jesus is raised, so we too would be raised. It gives us hope. But you know what it does for the non-believer? It demands a decision from him. See, the evidence of the resurrection is really overwhelming. We're going to see that, if you haven't seen that already. We're going to see that beginning next week, especially in the road to Emmaus, where Jesus appears to two more of the disciples. We will also chronicle through the other eyewitness accounts recorded in the New Testament writings that will show beyond the shadow of a doubt that indeed our Lord is risen. But if he is risen, which he is, then that demands a decision, even for the non-believer. It really does. You either receive it or you don't. It's one or the other. It can't be I'm undecided. What's logic 101? I'm a no decision means you're a decision. It's the wrong decision. You decided to not follow the Lord. A no decision is a decision. You can't be neutral. And so the evidence of the scriptures demands a verdict. It demands a decision. Decision even from the non-believer. Now, verse 11. And the words seemed to them like idle tales, and they did not believe them. Verse 12. But Peter rose and ran to the tomb, and stooping down, he saw the linen clothes by themselves, and he departed, marveling to himself at what had happened. Now, this is where you want to read the Gospel of John, chapter 20. And I'm going to read just three verses, five, six, seven, four verses from John, chapter 20 which embellishes this verse 12 in Luke chapter 24. Okay, so you can turn there with me. I'm going to read this to you. John chapter 20, verses 5, 6, 7, and 8. Okay, I'm going to read that right now. It says, and he, this would be John, the apostle, who wrote the Gospel of John, and he, stooping down and looking in, saw the linen clothes lying there, yet he did not go in. So remember when I mentioned that Mary Magdalene gets there first, she sees the sepulcher, uh, the stone rolled away from the sepulcher, so she doesn't even look in. She just runs and gets Peter and John. Then the other ladies come. Well, Peter and John, they come. Now, John outruns Peter, gets there first, and he looks in. Okay, that's what it's recording right here. So he, John, stooping down and looking in, saw the linen clothes lying there, yet he did not go in. Kind of got spooked, probably. Looked in, oh my goodness. And he came right back out. Now, verse 6. Then Simon Peter came following him and went into the tomb, and he saw the linen clothes lying there and the handkerchief that had been around his head, not lying with the linen clothes, but folded together in a place by itself. Verse 8, then the other disciple, which would be John again, who came to the tomb first, went in also, and he saw and believed. A little bit more embellishment of what we see in John chapter 24, verse 12. Now, we don't have time to get into this in detail, but if you study the original language of the passage here in John chapter 20, verses 5, 6, 7, 8 in Greek, you will find that there are actually three different words used here in this passage for the word saw, S-A-W. He saw, he saw, he saw. Three different words. Now, why would that be? 
Many of you know this, right? That in different languages, right? It doesn't translate actually word for word. So you have to do thought for thought because there's different words in different languages. Well, there's three different words for this word that's transliterated saw in John chapter 20, verses 5, 6, 7, and 8. And so in verse 5, when it says, And he, this would be John, stooping down and looking in, saw the linen clothes lying there that he did not go in. This word saw means to see something materially. And so you see something physically, materially. No understanding, but you just see it materially, right? That's what that word means. I believe it's the word blipo in the Greek. To see something materially. And so John saw the linen clothes lying there materially with no understanding. However, notice in verses 6 and 7 when Peter sees them. It says, Then Simon Peter came following him and went into the tomb, and he saw. Notice the same English word, but different Greek word. He saw the linen clothes lying there and the handkerchief that had been around his head. Not lying with the linen clothes, but, in, but folded together in a place by itself. Now, the word for Peter seeing is a different word, as I mentioned. It's the word thoreo. Does that sound familiar to you? It's from which we get our English word theoretical. Different word. You see, when Peter saw, he noticed something very peculiar. When he looked in, no body, but the linen clothes were still wrapped like it had a body in it. As one commentator put, I believe it was Wearsby, he said, it was like a cocoon, perfectly wrapped, but nothing inside, without a body. And so when Peter saw, he said, this is very strange, and he began to study it, theoretical. He started to analyze. There's something very, very peculiar about this. And then when we read in verse 8 that John went in also again, after Peter went in and saw, it says, and he saw and believed. Now, this word is a different word in the Greek. It's the word edo. And if you look that up in the concordance, it means to perceive, to see with a perception. And notice it says, he saw and believed. He saw and he understood. The light bulb went off. He perceived the truth. And so going back to our Luke chapter 23, verse 12 passage, notice in verse 12 it says, but Peter rose and ran to the tomb and stooping down, he saw the linen clothes. This is a thoreo lying by themselves. He began to study it. And he departed marveling to himself at what had happened. You see, what was happening was that Peter along with John, they were beginning to see. They were beginning to understand. They were beginning to know the truth of the resurrection. Until that night was over their heads. And no doubt, they began to remember what Jesus had told them prior to his death, that he would be persecuted and put to death, and on the third day would rise. You ever had that happen? Light bulb goes off and you start to remember. Ah, that's why. That's why my mom and dad told me not to do that or whatever. Right? Yeah, light bulb goes off. It comes with maturity. It comes with seasoning. It comes with time. It comes with age. It comes with maturity. They said, ah. Now we understand. They began to understand the resurrection. And so next week, we're going to read about two more eyewitness accounts of the risen Lord. It's on the road to Emmaus. Also, he's going to appear to the 11 multiple times. And as I mentioned, he's going to even appear to 500 at one time. I'm going to go cross-reference to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. And so truly, the resurrection is going to be verified through hundreds of eyewitness accounts. Can you imagine? Hundreds. And so there's ample evidence to believe. It's evidence that really demands a verdict. It demands a decision. To either believe and receive Jesus as Lord or not. Not believe and deny him and his invitation for salvation. You see, there's one way to eternal life. I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. Who said that? Not my words, it's his words. Is it relative or absolute? Oh, it's absolute. 
It's absolute. Not always lead to heaven. I am the way, the truth, and life. No one comes to the Father but by me, through me. Exclusive, not relative. And so there's a decision with this evidence of the resurrection to be made. It's evidence that demands a decision. And so next week, we're going to look at the account of the road to Emmaus and his appearing to the other disciples. More evidence for us to receive and to believe. As Christians, our great hope is what? Just this resurrection. We have great hope. And it's not in this life, people. It's not in this life. Our hope is in heaven. Live this life for heaven. And you'll fulfill what God has called you to do in this life. Do not live this life for the things of this life. Live your life for God and fulfill your call. Everything else is passing away. As a matter of fact, you know, I'll just throw this in there. You know, for some reason, I've become the trustee on several trusts. You know what that means? A trust means that when you die, it goes to everybody else. That's what it means. Everything you work for in this life. It's either going to go to your, to probate, to the government, or to your beneficiaries. You're not going to take any of it with you. That's the point. Nothing. And yet we would spend all our time, energy, and resources, get stressed out about those very things. People invest in heaven, invest in eternity, invest in Jesus. Those are the greatest returns, amen? Lord, we thank you for your word. Help us, I pray, to have these priorities set squarely in our hearts. Set us apart, I pray. Teach us, mature us, oh Lord, that we would age with wisdom. I ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Children of the living God, sing to the living.